Hiya, friends. Hi, right back at you. Here is another episode of the top 10 favorite, and from what I believe are the best performances by some of the greatest actors in all of cinema. I am starting from 10 and then hugging my way up to number one. And make no mistake about it, my friends, I have seen every film attainable of these artists, so there are no buts about it when I say every list here comes from truthful, loving, giving, compassionate accuracy. Happy Pride Month again, my friends, and this time I would love to talk about, I believe, one of the most underrated actors ever. He is one of those actors you have seen in various pictures, a lot of television, and a groundbreakingly, powerfully beautiful actor inside and out. His name, of course, is Paul Winfield. Now, Paul was born in Dallas, Texas from a single mother who was a union organizer for the garment industry until his stepfather came in the picture when he was about eight years old. His family was always on the move, primarily moving around LA, where he became very inspired by the arts, thus joining the actor studio and other repertory theaters. He was even a gifted violinist and cellist and earned a scholarship to Yale, but turned it down to still pursue the craft of acting. From there, the impact of Paul Winfield was just beginning. Paul Winfield, yes indeed, my friends, is another actor that is truly underrated. He is one of those actors that made every role Shakespearean in the most modern way. If Paul Winfield was ever phoning in a role, you hardly noticed it because he was always so present. You know me by now, guys. I only cover film. But yes, we can't leave out the fact that Paul Winfield definitely gained more popularity and promise out of his career on television sitcoms and miniseries. Such classic shows from his very first appearance on Perry Mason, Mannix, Diane Carroll's series Julia, The Blue and the Gray, Roots, The Next Generations, which he was nominated for an Emmy, The Women of Brewster Place, which he gives such a memorable and effective performance as Sam, Oprah's husband, L.A. Law, the animated show Gargoyles, does anybody remember that show? Plus, narrating the docuseries City Confidential, which is such a great show. Not to mention his other notable work in The Sophisticated Gents. Most notably, though, he blessed the world in 1978, portraying the iconic and legendary leader himself, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in the miniseries King, for which he was also nominated for an Emmy. He gives such a breath of life and total justice to the king himself that you hang on every word he gives you. But Paul's big honor for television came in 1994 on the popular small town series Picket Fences, playing Judge Harold Nance, the ill judge who literally is on a mission to integrate the whitest of white towns of Rome, Wisconsin, with mixed races, which causes a huge uproar within the town. It's amazing how in this show's third season, Paul steps in and elevates it to the top. And the show was already a hit from its first two seasons. For Paul's two episodes, only two he guest starred in, he received the Emmy for Best Performance by a Guest Actor. And seriously, after watching the show myself, he should have been brought back. I loved his character. Paul had fantastic dialogue to work with, but as far as his television series work goes, this is a triumph because he turns what is first viewed as an antagonist to such an empathetic soul with guts and understanding. You will see how easy it was for Paul to be such a consistent working actor because of that very discipline, giving everything to your character, treating it like Shakespeare. And with his beautiful baritone voice, you would have thought he was trained with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And he was just so humble enough that he would just let the work do the talking. So let's get busy, my friends, and talk about the top 10 best performances of the underrated and majestical Paul Winfield. Now, to start off at number 10, we have Gordon's War. Man, such a fun soul film, which some call a black exploitation film, but nah, man, they're soul films. Directed by the legend 
Ossie Davis. This features Paul Winfield in the starring role of Gordon Hudson, a Vietnam vet who comes back to Harlem to find his wife dead due to her addiction to heroin. With the Vietnam War still raging in his body, he plans to go to war on the pimps and pushers in Harlem who have turned Harlem into a battlefield. He'll need the help of three of his buddies to do it, and their whole operation is legit. My God, the way they crack down on the dealers is just captivatingly wild. To see Paul Winfield in such a role like this was quite a surprise, but I loved every bit of it. To see him take control and kick some major ass is a phenomenally kick-ass time. Like when he's in the alley with the punk and he says, I want your ass. I love all of his voiceover of their plan and journal entries like the great line, we're gonna use all the tools of the trade. We're gonna drive those bastards out. Ossie Davis meticulously directs this piece in such a manner that films perfectly with the time of soul films. It's a somewhat rare film to find, but it's doable. So I say, do yourself a favor and check out Paul Winfield's kick-ass performance. Number nine, Twilight's Last Gleaming. Quite an entertaining political thriller satire, loosely based on the book Viper 3. Burt Lancaster plays a renegade Air Force general who escapes prison to take hostage of an ICBM silo in Montana and threatens the President of the United States to launch the missiles and start World War III if the President won't reveal the secret documents about the Vietnam War. Paul Winfield plays one of Burt's partners in the takeover, along with good old Burt Young. And once again, Paul Winfield kicks some ass to get to the missiles. Under the direction of Robert Aldrich, the film moves pretty quickly. And some good split, triple, and sometimes quadruple screen action here. But Paul Winfield is the man here. He just wants some freedom and peace of mind. The ending is quite tense as well. So if you like political thrillers, yeah. Check Paul out in this one as well. Number eight, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. All right, I know this absolutely should be much higher because Paul Winfield's masterfully giving performance as Captain Terrell of the Reliant is one of the most engaging, but also one of the most tragic, my God, Obviously, the greatest Star Trek film made thus far, some will argue, The Voyage Home is, but famously, this sequel to the horrendously boring Star Trek The Motion Picture, Jesus Christ, was not welcomed by all cast members at first, until they really dove in the script and everyone got a second wind. Shatner's never been better as Kirk here, but Paul Winfield gives so much gravitas and heart to this film, who was cast by director Nicholas Meyer after seeing Paul's previous work, and he just wanted to work with him. Although Paul's screen time is way too limited, he leaves a great impact that ends so shockingly. As a follow-up to the classic Star Trek original series episode, Space Seed, Khan, an old friend and nemesis of Kirk, escapes and captures Winfield and Chekhov. Ricardo Montalban, my God, talk about an actor who showed up to work. He gives us a phenomenally, sadistically charming performance as Khan. Khan! Caution, my friends. There will be some spoilers for this one. I'm sorry. I just can't help it for this one. But the sequence where Khan injects the men with eels that put them on a deep mind control frightened me so much. And when Terrell and Chekhov are ordered to kill Kirk, we see the debate in Paul's face. We see the insecurity with it all because he refuses to kill another over the mind control of Khan. And I love how Meyer, the director, just slowly zooms in on Paul's inner turmoil. And Paul just gives us everything with the final decision to rip off the wristband and sacrifice himself for the crew. He literally goes out in a blaze of glory with his phaser. But what's messed up about it is that he's hardly mentioned again when he just sacrificed himself for the damn Enterprise. Hashtag justice for Terrell, man. Sure, what was written as a thankless role could have been played by anybody. But when you have Paul Winfield in to play, you ain't getting no freaking day player here. He was the real McCoy. Not you, Bones. Damn it, Jim. Number seven, Tyson. The 1995 made-for-HBO movie about the notorious boxing champ, Mike Tyson. 
played pretty well by Michael Jai White. His voice isn't always consistent, but he definitely gave his heart and soul in bringing Tyson to life. Paul Winfield, in his beautiful glory, plays the fraudulent promoter himself, Don King, only in America. Paul is utterly fantastic as this king. He captures the showmanship of Don King that you can't misplace, and he wears that hair so perfectly. You would only think it was his own hair. Paul's screen time is again quite limited. He doesn't show up until the 50 minute mark in an 102 minute film, but when he's on, oh baby, is he on. He schemes his way to become Mike Tyson's new promoter. It has a great cast, including the lovable George C. Scott, Clark Gregg, Malcolm Jamal Warner, Tony Lobianco, but Paul Winfield is the greatest scene stealer of this film, unintentionally. He just captivates you, as you would expect, Dong King to capture you. Some may say Paul goes a little over the top, but you know what? It actually works for playing the man himself. Why wouldn't it? Paul Winfield was so damn effective and entertaining as King that he even reprised him again, twice, on The Simpsons, technically as Lucius Sweet, but it is just perfect. Number six. White Dog, a slightly underground horror drama based on the novel by Romaine Gary, which was actually based on a true story Gary experienced with real actress Jean Seberg, simply about a stray white shepherd dog who was found by Julie, played by Christy McNichol, and after having trouble finding its owner, she in turn, of course, wants to keep him, because you know, he's just so darn cute, only to find out the dog was trained to kill, and not just that, kill black people. So she takes the dog to Keys, a dog trainer played by none other than Paul Winfield, who has seen this kind of behavior before and goes through the long and strenuous trial and methodology to cure the dog of racism. On paper, this may sound ridiculous to some people, but oh, oh no, my dear friends. What director Samuel Fuller was able to do with this picture is truly captivating and spine tingling. Paul Winfield is absolutely perfect as Keys. He captures the stubborn and committed mindset of a man who will not give up in the inner turmoil of the hate that's been attacking him and the black community for generations. Is it ever tense? Like the moving sequence when Paul is just holding up his hand to the dog, awaiting to see what he'll do. Or the monumental finale where we want to believe the dog is cured Spoiler alert, and the final slow-mo shot on Paul's face is so heartbreaking because we see the years and years of effort, the brutal hours and hours of saving animals from horrendous hate, which of course poses the question, can racism be cured, even in animals? The film itself has such a wild history. At one point, having Roman Polanski directing and starring Jessica Lange, and then getting a full exploitation treatment to it, which in turn was heavily criticized and hated by black audiences, especially the NAACP, because of the very simple and horrible events of black people being attacked and killed, not to mention, apparently from reports, not a lot of black crew members were hired on the picture. Co-script writer Curtis Hansen and Samuel Fuller have always defended the film for its allegory on racism and the brutality of it. Paul Winfield's beautifully honest portrayal in a film that deserves more attention. Number five, Green Eyes. A surprisingly effective made-for-TV movie starring Paul Winfield as Lloyd Dubeck. Again, a Vietnam War vet. Paul just can't escape Vietnam movies, man. But he is disabled from the war and returns home to discover he can't find work, just like thousands of troops. So left with nothing in his life, he decides to go back to Saigon and find his half-black, half-Vietnamese son that was born from a Vietnamese mistress, which obviously is a lot more challenging and, of course, more purposeful than he ever imagined. What sets his son apart is apparently the fact his son has green eyes. The film is so great, winning the Peabody Award for its excellence, and since it was made two years after the end of the Vietnam War, it was clearly significant. 
and so scary a story to even tell. America was still recovering, but this touching story definitely lifts the spirit rather than break it down. Paul Winfield is utterly phenomenal in the lead role. Why he wasn't nominated for an Emmy for his performance, I, I will never know, because he carries the film with such grace and gravitas. The only downside of this film is the performance of Rita touching him. I'm, I'm sorry, but my God, she takes you completely out of the scene and just overacting the hell out of this. And she's a fantastic actress, don't get me wrong at all. Even giving a brilliant performance in another film about green eyes, a uh, girl with green eyes. But Paul Winfield holds it together with reality and a true presence. The many scenes where he's with the orphans and giving his heart to them are just lovely. If you ever get a chance, my friends, this film is 100% worth your time because of Paul Winfield's exquisite performance. Number four, it's good to be alive. My goodness, what a fantastic made-for-TV film about the recovery of Brooklyn Dodger Roy Campanella, who became a paraplegic after a sudden car crash. In the lead role of Roy, Paul Winfield gives such an, again, an Emmy-worthy performance, capturing the loss of all the hope and dreams of a man who not only had more to do within the MLB, wanted to be more active with his family. Roy Campanella has an extraordinary story, which I, I briefly talked about on the video of Ruby D, with her fantastic performance here as Roy's wife, Ruth. But starting off in the Negro Leagues, of course, since this was the 1930s when he started playing, he wanted to move right on up and slowly winning championships his way to becoming a Brooklyn Dodger in the minor league, to then earning the catcher spot in the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1948. His auto accident occurred in 1958, which left him paralyzed, which is absolutely a tragic event. But you can let your story end in tragedy or in victory. And thanks to help of Roy's physical therapist, Sam, played wonderfully by Louis Gossett Jr., he works and he works to gain his strength back and to hopefully inspire future players. You gain his disappointment right from the get-go and we slowly see himself becoming a man of real responsibility to overcome his new challenge. It's terrific stuff that director Michael Landon, that's right, Charles from Little House on the Prairie, guided out of Paul, which makes for such a powerfully moving piece and one of the best in Paul's career. Number three, go tell it on the mountain. Again, with the beautiful pictures and beautiful performances, especially from Paul Winfield as Gabriel Grimes, an honorable preacher and yet domineering father who wants his son, John, to join him in the church. But John's constant disconnect with the church, but more so with his father, keeps extending the emotional distance, which continuously makes John believe his father doesn't love him. Based on the famous and phenomenal novel of the same name by the great James Baldwin, this made-for-TV film was produced by American Playhouse, which gives it such depth that it deserves. This was a film and performance of Paul Winfield that was already somehow familiar, but yet was so different. For me personally, it was such a surprising and yet unnerving feeling to see Paul play such a cold and sometimes hostile father. But like James Baldwin's novel, the story is told in a non-linear fashion where we see things from John's point of view and Gabriel's flashbacks where a young Ving Rhames would play a younger version of Paul Winfield. Funny enough, as mentioned previously, both actors would play Don King in separate films. Crazy! The whole cast is fantastic, of course, with Rosalind Cash, Rose Weaver, Ruby Dee, Alfred Woodard, Giancarlo Esposito, and many more. The tense moments between Paul and James Bond III, who plays John, are truly hard to watch, so much that it's still hard to believe it's Paul Winfield. But in all of his glory, it is all him. And being this film is available in public domain, do yourself a favor, guys, and experience Paul in this grand film adaptation of one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. Number two, a hero ain't nothing but a sandwich. This may be surprising to some folks, but I tell you, friends, the performance of Paul Winfield as once again 
a father-like figure, but not so unloving this time, is what makes this film stand out among his greats. Here he is a father-like figure who is stepping up, adapted by the amazing playwright and novelist Alice Childress. From her own novel, we have Benji, a 13-year-old bright kid in South Central who lives with his mom and grandmother, played wonderfully by Cicely Tyson and Helen Martin. And occasionally, his mom's boyfriend, Butler, Paul Winfield, comes over from time to time. It's obvious that Benji is falling apart without a real father, even though Butler does everything he can to be a good father for him. Regardless, Benji falls into the wrong crowd and slowly becomes a heroin addict. The real question is, can he rise up and overcome his demons when he is sent to rehab and learn to embrace the family he has? This film adaptation, I'll be honest folks, is far from perfect because we feel there are beats being skipped and no real investment made as a filmmaking standpoint. But as said before, what saves this film and makes it very significant are the performances, including young Larry B. Scott as Benji, who obviously has to carry the whole film. And he opens his soul up for us to feel his pain. The chemistry between Larry and Paul Winfield, of course, is just magical. All of their scenes together are so precious and caring that it cements Paul Winfield's noble ability to appear as such a model, yet humanly flawed father. Paul really gets to show more range in his performance here as well, really letting us in his challenge of being a sax player, but needing to take a full-time maintenance job to provide for himself and the family. It's obvious that his own upbringing with his own stepfather must have played a significant inspiration for his performance with Larry. His monologue towards the end where he and Benji need to talk to the rehab counselor and how he carries on about the slip of suggestions of noble heroes he received from the office stating, heroes are only celebrities, declaring how important a working man who sacrifices, who gives everything he can for his son, can be a real hero. It is spellbinding. For his work, he only received an NAACP Image Award for Best Actor. And if the film was made better, he would have received more because it is a dear performance that should be cherished by avid fans of Paul Winfield to this day. All right, my friends, here are some honorable mentions. The Legend of Gatorface. Yeah, my 10-year-old self is speaking up. And okay, this made for Showtime Kids film is not necessarily the best. We all know that. But when you have Paul Winfield in the picture as a wise old man living near the swamp, waiting on the appearance of the legendary Gator Face to show his neighbors he's not crazy, you have a swell time. Two kids, Danny and Phil, hear about that story from Paul's character, Bob, and decide to pull a little joke, but yet help him out by dressing up like Gator Face as best as they can to help show the locals he's not crazy. But... What if Gatorface actually shows up? It's cheesy 1990s camp fun with Paul Winfield on set giving such a lovely performance again, so lovely that it earned him a daytime Emmy nomination for Best Supporting Actor. How about that? Mars Attacks. One hell of a great and damn funny satire film with Paul Winfield among a phenomenal cast as General Casey, commander of the armed forces of the United States of America. Based on the trading cards, director Tim Burton fashioned this after all, the great sci-fi B-movies of the 50s, and Paul Winfield only has about two to three scenes, but he is just a delightful presence here, as he always is, especially being the first military official to welcome the Martian ambassador. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I was honestly so sad about what happened to him when I saw this as a kid. Because at seven years old, you're not quite ready for dark comedy and satire. But of course, I love the crap out of this cult classic now. Just as Martin Short said about Paul Winfield in this film, he did that well. The Terminator. Starring not just Arnold, not just Linda Hamilton, not just Michael Bean, but Paul frickin' Winfield as Police Lieutenant Ed Traxler, who becomes interested and notified on the strange killings of women named Sarah Connor and random civilians. It must be this guy with the cool jacket and finger gloves and flaming muzzles who can't be stopped, who can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. 
and it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. Oddly enough, the role of Lieutenant Traxler was offered to Louis Gossett Jr. and Edward James Olmos, which they would have been great, but once again, Paul Winfield just brings a certain amount of gravitas and respect to the role of Traxler, who does his job pretty well until the horrible massacre at the station, where Arnold wasn't lying. He said he'd be back, and I'm sorry, to me, it's still in debate if Paul officially died on the floor there. He only got him once. Seemed pretty fatal, but I'm willing to say he lived through that. I don't care what you say, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. The best part about Paul Winfield is his chemistry with Lance Henriksen here. Those two together are just great. And it's a sign of great writing from Cameron, for once. But it all comes from the actors to bring it to reality. Especially in a low-budget, guerrilla, filmmaking-style movie of this kind. The great characteristics of Paul Winfield drinking the coffee and Lance saying, The coffee is two hours cold. Mm-hmm. I put a cigarette in it. And then asking Lance for a cigarette. Then noticing one in his hand. <laughs> or even the great exchange, How do I look? Like shit, boss. Yo mama. Great character work. Presumed Innocent. A nice, smart little courtroom thriller that Paul Winfield lobbied hard for. Based on the novel by Scott Turow, Paul actually read the novel first, and he said to his agent, if they ever make a film of this novel, I want to play the Honorable Judge Little. And amazingly enough, three years later, Paul would get the call after lobbying for the part that he would fill the role. Paul, as the judge, brings again so much gravitas to the film. I mean, we already have a fantastic cast with what? Harrison Ford, Raul Julia, Brian Dennehy, Bonnie Bedelia, the West Wing boys, John Spencer and Bradley Whitford, and directed by Oscar nominee Alan J. Pacula, the great man behind All the President's Men, and many more. The film itself is not perfect, but Paul gives so many beautiful lines that you can tell this role meant so much to him, and he certainly left an impact. That's for damn sure. Huckleberry Finn, the first 1974 musical adaptation with new songs by the great Sherman Brothers, the men behind Mary Poppins, and a whole bunch of the great Disney classics. Paul plays Mark Twain's classic character, Jim, who helps Huck sail down the Mississippi River to freedom, but encounter a whole bunch of characters and hijinks along the way. Of all the film adaptations of Huckleberry Finn, this one is not the best. <laughs> The songs are good, joyful. Paul Winfield has such a sweet singing voice as well, but the film altogether just does not hold up, and some scenes indeed hit a factor of cringe. However, the effort did inspire the great Tony Award-winning musical adaptation, Big River. Paul Winfield only agreed to do the film if there were no singing slaves, for he said, Gone with the Wind was one of the traumas of his life. Filming on location in Natchez, Mississippi, was not the best for Mr. Winfield, as you can imagine. Encountering so much racism, harassed by the local police, and even arrested for possession of marijuana, which Paul claimed he was framed for. Now, I wouldn't doubt it. Through it all, Paul gives some of the more moving scenes as Jim. My hat is always off to him for always retaining a level of class. Number one, of course, Sounder. Of course it's number one, for it features Paul Winfield's only Academy Award nominated performance for Best Actor, being only the third black male actor to be nominated in the lead role, previous nominees being Sidney Poitier, who later won, and then James Earl Jones. Paul Winfield warms our heart as Nathan Lee Morgan, the patriarch of the family of five, who will do anything anything for his family. Even if he had a bad night at hunting for supper, he will steal a ham from a rich plantation owner to feed his family, which he obviously does, and then is arrested. So it's up to his wife, Rebecca, played brilliantly by Cicely Tyson, of course, to carry on their sharecropping while he is put away with an unknown chain gang, while his oldest son, David Lee, will in turn do whatever he can to find his father. Based on the novel by William H. Armstrong, this film made history. However, it still was an independent feature, with Paul and Cicely only being paid $10,000 for their work on the film. But 
they knew, they knew they were investing in a story that really meant something. I've already seen so many of Paul Winfield's films before I saw Sounder when I was a teenager. But when I did, it solidified how powerful of an actor he was. His charisma and infectious energy makes his somewhat limited screen time all worth it. When he's with David in the jail cell and David brings in the cake Rebecca made and they share it together to the climactic argument they both have when David wants to stay at their farm in Louisiana with his family versus going to a better school, then Nathan just orders him to go, even being rough on him. For just like an honorable and truly loving father, he wants only the best for his son. The most iconic scene, obviously, is on a quiet sunny day, and in the distance, Rebecca hears footsteps along the path. She stares out from the porch and gets a little closer and sees off in the distance. It looks like Nathan with a crutch, but Nathan was still in prison as far as they knew. But sure enough, it was Nathan. <laughs> and Cicely Tyson passionately yells out his name and they run towards each other. No music, just the sound of them running and panting and crying and the whole embrace between them and the kids. It is such a classic Hollywood moment, which is so moving every time I see it. And how about this? The director Marty Ritt asked Cicely and Paul to do it again because the cameraman was so moved, tearing up while shooting it, that they weren't sure they got the shot. Jeez, you damn actors, why do you have to be so damn good? Don't you know the crew are trying to do their job here? It's <laughs> Cicely refused at first, but they went ahead and they ended up using that first take, and rightfully so. Paul's moving portrayal was such an inspiration that when Disney remade Sounder in 2003 with Kevin Hooks, the actor who portrayed David Lee directing, they cast Paul Winfield as the teacher this time, and he was lovely then as well, but nothing beats the magnitude that is his Nathan. Well, that's what makes you a star. Magnetism, charisma, indeed, talent plays a part. But also, if you have a strong work ethic, there's nothing that will stop you. Nothing that can stop Paul. Yes, diabetes would slow him down, unfortunately, but would kick back with his pugs that he bred and showed at dog shows. But eventually, a sudden heart attack at the humble age of 64 would end up taking his life. But his legacy certainly lives on. I'm not sure if any of you would be thinking, what? I didn't know Paul Winfield was gay. Paul wasn't exactly spreading the word about his sexual orientation because you all remember these times of the 1960s, 70s, etc. in Hollywood. It just wasn't talked about and revealed in the press if someone was openly gay. Look at Rock Hudson. As someone once said about Paul, he was openly gay in his life, if not in the media. So you would want to say his private life with his long-term partner of 30 years, Charles Gillen Jr., was indeed filled with joy and passion. For this Pride Month and every month, let's remember this amazingly pure gem of a man, for he has given us characters to love, respect, and cherish. Time has indeed run out, my friends. Now comment below. Do you agree with my picks, guys? What are your favorite performances of this world-class treasure of a man? Paul Winfield. If you do like this, please click like, subscribe, and don't forget to tell all your friends who are classic film lovers like yourselves. If you want to submit any requests, you can follow the Patreon page where you can gain access to more content, get shoutouts, and offers for some new prizes, actually. I'm not kidding. But until next time, my friends, Thank you all so much for watching. And always remember, you lose some of the time what you always go after. But you lose all the time what you don't go after. <laughs>